here to talk about the Internet of Everything, not the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, and that's an important distinction. Um, we have a great group of panelists here to speak with us today. Vishak Aradia from Cisco, Managing Director and Global Lead, very focused on the Internet of Everything and Internet of Everything products at Cisco. Michael Mandel, the Chief Economic Strategist of the Progressive Policy Institute, and you're focused on the data-driven economy, innovation. And the Internet of Everything as applied to the whole economy. Okay. Um, Amit Kumar, CEO and co-founder of Bitponics, which basically gets your garden and your plants online. So any of you with brown thumbs out there, maybe this can help you. Um, and Greg Ross, Global Director for Product Strategy and Infotainment, focused on connected cars at right. General Motors. Right. And two Detroit residents, natives? Natives? Yes. Go blue. All right, all right. <laughs> this is my first time to Detroit, so I'm learning a lot about the city and I love it so far. Welcome. Um, Greg, I want to start with you since okay. you're the car guy. Um, you know, we're in Motor City. Everybody wants to know, I think, why isn't my car as smart as my phone? And how do, how do, <laughs> how do we get it there? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's a question we're working to answer, I think. And that's, it, we talk about Internet of Everything, Internet of Things. We've seen the opportunity to connect cars to one another and to the infrastructure for a long time, all the way back to uh, launching OnStar back in 1997. And we're just continuing to expand on that, uh, putting more connected technology into our vehicles, inviting developers in to work with us and develop applications that work in the car and make your car a better car and a more connected car. So we think not only will your car get smarter, but um, we envision that your car will get smarter and smarter and more personalized as you drive it and as you own it. So great opportunity, we think. Now, Vishaka, Cisco's been really focused on the internet of everything. What does that mean in terms of products? Like, what do you guys actually do? Very fair question. Um, so hopefully later we'll talk about some of the, uh, the overall research that we've done in the consulting services organization. But in terms of products, absolutely our entire suite of collaboration products, whether it's video conferencing or video endpoints or unified communications, our whole platform there, or obviously our WebEx platform where I'm sure many of you are taking your calls and sharing content with our application from the cloud. All of these products plus we have a whole new business unit now called the Internet of Things business unit that is strictly focused on really leveraging all the things in the network and all the products that you can create to really connect all these things that are still yet to be connected. Right. So how, is that how you define it? What, is it? what does it really mean, the Internet of Everything? <laughs> So we, perhaps ours is a little different than others, so that might be a fun, controversial <laughs> thing to talk about. Um, so when we think about the internet of everything, it's really about four things. People, process, data, and things. So it's all four things, and coming together from a networked connection standpoint, that's really how we're defining the internet of everything. And it's not just about the technology, and it's not just about the new capabilities or the experience that it helps. It's fundamentally about the economic value. It's about fundamentally what it will do for business and individuals and organizations. Um, Amit, you've taken a thing, plants, gardens, and you've connected it to the internet. That's right. Tell us about Bitponics, what you do, and how you did it. it. Yeah, um, so what we do is we create products that automate and socialize hydroponic gardening. So we uh, have a physical device that sits in your garden, monitors all the stuff your plants care about, the nutrients, the uh, temperature, light levels, sends it all up to the web where you can get a real-time view of how your garden is doing, and then you can connect with other growers to share tips on how to grow different gardens better. So how many people do you have? So we are actually of... still a, a pre-launch startup. Uh, okay. I'm here sort of representing like the early stage movement of, of this internet of everything. Um, so we have a couple of pilot projects going right now. Uh, last year, we had a Kickstarter campaign, which uh, was successful. We raised enough to do a small production run. So right now, we're in the end stages of getting those units out. So, uh, so we'll be learning pretty, pretty soon what the, the market viability of our product is. All right. Now, okay, Michael, what does this mean economically? You know, well, what is the value uh, of the internet? I just want to say that as, as a former professor, I'm, I sort of feel like almost like saying, everyone come closer. Yeah. Everyone come move down. <laughs> Please, feel free. I'm going to be taking questions <laughs> no. from you guys later. Yeah, so. If you have something you want to ask. Let me just actually step back and take the big picture. We've had, we've had a lot of uh, sort of movement of the internet into our daily lives. But if you think about it, the internet has mostly transformed 
information intensive industries, like journalism, uh, like entertainment, uh, like communications. What we, what we haven't had, surprisingly, it becomes much harder to use the internet to actually transform physical industries. It's much more complicated. That's why what GM is doing is so impressive. Yeah. The physical world needs a lot more information. You need a lot of sensors. You need a lot of big data capability to process. You need to have ways of getting it to people to make decisions. And so, from an economic point of view, we've had a two-track economy. The information-intensive industries have really jumped forward. Physical industries like manufacturing and transportation haven't had been affected that much. So I think what we're going to see as the Internet of Everything spreads out, um, we're actually going to see the whole economy speed up. We're going to see uh, wages increase. And we should be able to see more job growth. So this is really the second or third or fourth stage of the internet, and it may be uh, among the most important. And I read, isn't GM like quadrupling its tech staff or something like yeah, that? Yeah, significantly adding to tech staff, and, and, and a lot of it is in, in this software area. I mean, it's, so, so what kind the, of a, a car is a software-defined device in the same way that a lot of other devices are today. And, and because it's software-defined, we have the ability to make it able to do additional things and more customized and more personalized. Can it drive it's, faster? <laughs> as long as it's legal, of course, and safe. Um, so what kinds of things are you working on? You know, there are so many, my car will be able to drive itself someday. Will I be able to talk to it and just tell it what to do? Well, we've heard a lot about the, the self-driving cars thing, and I think that's, that's certainly part of the future. It's part of what connecting your car to the internet could enable and to, the, to getting the sensors that you need to make that possible. But, not having to wait for all that to happen, and we can already improve the way your vehicle ownership works by the car knows when it needs maintenance done. It knows when it needs fuel. It can help uh, make your day more convenient and make your car last longer by helping you get those things done when you need them done. Um, simple things like that, we can help you uh, connect your car to um, your, maybe your insurance provider if you want to share that information. Uh, to help uh, get usage-based insurance. That's something that we've worked on as well. Uh, and because there's data from the car that can be used to help judge uh, how you're using the vehicle and, and that they can use to help give you a better service experience. So we're finding a lot of opportunities and a lot of use. And the other thing that's been revealing to us is some of these uses are so specialized that it's really important that we open ourselves up to ideas from outside their, our company. So um, how do you do that? We stood up a, uh, a developer site, developer.gm.com, in January. Um, we've got 3,000 developers now registered and uh, submitting applications, both applications that pull data from the car as well as applications that run in the car. And we had a great example of one. I, I found out kind of painfully how important it was to some of our drivers. Um, one person had created a service called Volt Stats. He was a Volt owner, he was excited about his performance of the Volt, wanted to keep track of how much energy usage he was using and how efficiently he was driving. He built a site to allow himself to compare it to others. And my uh, bad experience was we had to take it down for some security updates, and uh, I heard just how passionately attached every Volt owner was to Volt stats and, uh, and how important it was for them to be able to use that to monitor their driving. Um, it, from a product perspective, how hard is it to get something online that has never been online before? <laughs> it's a good question, and there's, there's a couple parts to it. You know, from building prototypes, it's not that difficult to get something online. You know, right now there is this maker movement around open source hardware, where you have the Arduino making it possible to build intelligent gadgets and physical things uh, a lot easier than you ever could before. Um, it's, it's a very simple programming language, and so to be able to, to introduce logic and technology into physical things is now a lot easier than, than it ever was before through Arduino, mainly. Um, and you know, part of the Arduino ecosystem is like Wi-Fi chips and Bluetooth chips. Um, so building the prototypes is, is not difficult. You know, one thing that we have encountered, though, is the difficulty of getting from a prototype to an actual like, finished, shippable product. Um, there's just you know, a, lot, a lot of uh, new issues that you encounter in transforming something from uh, development board into a, a mass manufacturable board. It's also about changing mindsets, isn't it? I mean, to get, get people to think, oh, hey, I can do all of these really cool things with technology that I haven't been used to doing. Like, I was interviewing Jack Dorsey, who you guys will be hearing from later today, the CEO of Square, you know, and he has this vision that whenever you, with Square Wallet, that whenever you walk into a restaurant or 
you know, a store, you should be able to pay without even taking out your phone. And they have that technology, but people don't use it as much because they have to change the mindset, essentially. You know, one of the places where the internet of everything is going to be really important is on the, on the ever, delivering local services, like sanitation, like environment, uh, uh, like a disaster relief and so forth. And in that case, what you're doing is you're offering better services to people more cheaply. And so it's not necessarily that hard. It's just a matter of getting maybe your workforce retrained mm. to sort of understand that this is going to help them uh, do better. Which takes time. Which takes time. This is, if you think about the definition that you said, which is it's not just about connecting up to the internet, but it's about people and data and processes as well. What you're really sort of talking about is you're talking about remaking your whole economy to work to be able to deal with this new information that you didn't have before to make better decisions. And so it's about retraining people too. Right? And so in some ways, in some ways, if you had uh, Internet of Everything hydroponics. Part of what you're doing is you're getting to get retraining people who formerly did it one way to do it another way. I actually want to say something about jobs because you're, Brooklyn has, it has one of the fastest growing tech communities in the country in part because of innovations like this. So this is job creating stuff, not job destroying stuff. Now Cisco has a number that you put on the Internet of Everything economy. Yes. It's quite large. Yes. Tell me what the number is. <laughs> the number is 14.4 trillion. So how do you come up, what is that number? How do you come up with that? It's a great point. It was actually derived from a set of 21 very specific use cases. So it's a bottoms up calculated number. Um, and that was summarized into five. So we've come up with five value drivers. But essentially, what that number is really about is in this internet of everything economy, what is the value at stake? What are companies going to be able to achieve from a profit standpoint? So what is this? OK, this is this big number with all these zeros. What does it really mean? So this is over the next 10 years. So over the next 10 years, 21% of corporate profits are up for grabs. And they're up for grabs either Either you're going to have an industry with a set of um, companies in there, or you might have another industry with another set of companies in there. This value will be grabbed by anyone who's taking advantage of the internet of everything in an industry. They'll be taking that profit from another um, uh, competitor in their industry. But the other place that the value can happen is when one industry disrupts another. My colleague here, I think, is going to have us all by making produce in our backyards <laughs> as opposed to Ooh, going to the store to buy produce, which I'm cool. all over. <laughs> Um, so my point is there's this disruption possible between industries. So that was clearly something we took into account and consideration. We also took cost reduction into consideration, employee productivity into consideration, and of course, net new revenue. What are the amazing new things you're now going to be able to do as you serve your customers? Let me give you one example. The um, state of Oklahoma, for whatever reason, has the highest number of um, strokes, and what they implemented was, uh, so, so, and they've only got these two hospitals with, with the specialists that you need to get to, and when you have a stroke, you really have to get to the hospital and have this one drug administered as soon as possible. If you don't, the consequences are not so great. So what did they do? You know, huge number of strokes. What they did was, they had these two hospitals. What they created was these medical centers, 15 of them across the state. The, Patients suffering from a stroke now don't have to go to those two hospitals. They can go to a medical center, and a nurse with the right process, with the right data, using something called Telestroke, which is some Cisco technology that incorporates video. So again, it's people, process, data, and things. The nurse is able to get the neurological consult, and they've already treated hundreds of people this way. So this is a way that, that you're really, in this case, the customer is really the patient, but you're really changing the way you serve, you serve patients going forward. And you're not just connecting things, you are getting data about these things that can then help make the product better down the line. I mean, the possibilities are sort of endless, aren't they? Yes, they are. And, and that is absolutely correct. You know, one of the other things is you're seeing disruptors 
trying to disrupt industries that haven't been, tr been traditionally disrupted, like Square is not a Visa or a MasterCard. Apple and Google are getting into cars. Sure. Where, do, where does that, do you watch them? Are you watching what Google's doing with the self-driving car? Are you, are you listening to Apple and the, and well, the innovation sure. they want to do on the dashboard? Absolutely, because it's, it's, those, are, uh, those companies have uh, close relationships with a lot of our customers, and those, our customers bring their devices into our cars. And yeah, it's, it's something we have to work on is, on the one hand, we have to make it easy for our customers to use the devices that they bring into their cars, and, and we know we have to do that, and we have to do that competitively. But we also think that the car is a device too, and it has its own needs and value to be connected with the rest of the system. So we don't view ourselves as being in competition with the phone that the customers are bringing in. We view it as additive, and uh, being connected allows us to do things because of the better access to the data on the vehicle and our better ability to design services just for use in the vehicle. We can do things that are not as easily done just with your phone. Let, let me just add something to this. As the car delivers more value, people will buy more cars. As people buy more cars, that will generate more jobs. So there's a, there's a link between this conversation. Usually people think about technology as being job destroying, but as the innovation spreads out from the tech sector into other areas of the economy, what you're gonna see is, is job creation rather than job destruction, because it's very, it's very clear, okay, well, it does both. So the question right. is, does it create more jobs well, than it does? Well, what we see is that in the, in the tech industries have been adding jobs. The places where you have innovate, actually actual innovation creates jobs. So as the innovation spreads to other areas of the economy, it becomes job creating. I mean, I'll give an example that's not Internet of Everything, but what was mentioned, uh, was mentioned earlier, if you have what's going on in the, in the gas shale area was innovation, and it's been job creating there. Anything that you can do that improves the quality of the product, potentially improves the demand, and potentially creates more, potentially creates more jobs. If you think, let's suppose that, that his product spreads and he becomes very rich. Okay? Which is what we hope for you. Which is what we, remember the little people. Mm. Okay, let's suppose that that happens when you're, then what you're sort of talking about is the creation of lots of jobs in that area that didn't exist before transformative in a way that hasn't happened in agriculture, in food creation. So part of what we're seeing is this may, the internet of everything may, may bring in an era where of job creation rather than job destruction. I completely agree here. I, I think this, this whole notion of jobs, the, the research that we did, and I'll tell you the answer and then I'll tell you the sort of meat behind the research, but two thirds of the 7,500 people that we, um, we researched when we, we did part of our 14.4 um, trillion, two thirds of them basically said the jobs will stay the same or increase. So clearly, clearly, and, and just to sort of make a point about the 7,500, it's a relevant number because the closest survey, it's a large number. It was done with uh, 12 countries, which represent 70% of the, the GDP of the world. So what's relevant about that number is the, the second biggest survey, one of them that's done by IBM, they do a great job, is, is the CEO survey, it's 1,200 people. This was 7,500 people, 70% 70 of the GDP, 12 countries, and 17 different job types. Bottom line, two-thirds of them are saying jobs will increase. So I think that's uh, really evidence to support what Michael is saying. Now, Michael, you, you mentioned the more people who buy cars, the more jobs are created. One thing that I didn't realize is that I guess young kids these days want to buy phones and computers and they're not saving up for cars like they used to. Um, and, and part of mm. what companies like GM and Ford are doing is to try to make cars cooler, uh, yeah. to get teens you know, back interested in, into buying cars. How do you make cars more connected and better, <laughs> but also affordable? Yeah, and there, there are changes going on, and, and it's not going to be necessarily the same answers that we had, we've had in past generations. Part of the demand is more connectivity, and that's part of what we're trying to meet. Part of it is there are going to be some different business models. I mean, car sharing is a growing trend, um, and you need connectivity to make car sharing work and to make it work well. The more cars that are shared, though, that's worse for GM, isn't it? Maybe, and maybe not. I mean, it depends on who does the best job of making the cars that are compatible with those kinds of systems and makes them most connectable. 
to those kinds of systems. Part of what we're finding is that we're finding some advantage with some large fleet owners because our cars are more easily connectable. We can do things that, that our competitors can't or can't do as easily or as, at low, as, as low cost. So it, it remains to be seen in my mind. I think I, I wouldn't be as optimistic to say it's universally good. I think it will be disruptive in some places, but I generally think that we're going to be creating more value. You know, one live example we have, um, OnStar has six million customers. It employs several thousand people in our call centers every day. I like we, that uh, Harry Crane commercial, by the way. That's what's that? When Harry, so you have a commercial about OnStar that's yeah. narrated by Harry Crane of, well, his, the, the character is Harry yeah. Crane of Mad, Mad Men. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's done a good job. Yeah, it's good. It, but that's, it gets, but, it gets but the point OnStar across. is a perfect example of more possibilities remotely, you know, explain to us what... what... We, we get 150,000 calls a day from our cars. We, we unlock uh, 2,000 uh, cars a day, uh, door locks. People are always surprised by that amount of, of volume that we have. Our remote application, we have a remote application that allows people to remotely check the diagnostics on their car, check their fuel status, do remote starts, remote unlocks, and so forth, all from a smartphone app, which you can only do if the car has its own ability to connect. Why would you want to start your car remotely? You've never lived in Michigan, have yes. you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have not. I still don't, I still don't know. <laughs> okay. It's cold. If it's, uh, it if it's, if it's 10 degrees outside and you, have a 10, and you have a 10-minute walk to your car, okay. remote starting it from, from 100 feet away doesn't do you any good. But <laughs> remote starting it from Use your office as you lock your office door and walk out to your parking deck, it's, it's a beautiful a wonderful thing. thing. Okay. A wonderful, you. wonderful thing. You know, one of the <laughs> things we like to think about in this, this sort of dialogue we're having right now on, on connecting things is when we work with customers, it's often how do you get those creative juices flowing? And, and we talk about lighting up dark assets, things that you don't have access to today. If you're a retailer, perhaps it might be what would you do differently if you knew how many cars were coming into your parking lot? For General Motors, it might be, what would you do differently if you lit up the traffic light or the roads? Or, you, you know, just some interesting ways to think about um, the journey to the internet sure. of everything and lighting well, up the traffic light. Let me light just, let me just add one coming. example on, on, the, on the local level that's in the paper, which is that you can have smart trash cans. And the smart trash cans can tell you when they're full and when they're empty. So, there's, so the municipality can send out their trucks just to the ones that are full, which both makes, improves the service because you don't have overflowing trash cans and also saves fuel. And one of the things that you see with this is uh, there's a lot of potential for sort of conservation because you can actually see where you need to sort of run trucks or where you need to sort of use energy and uh, it has enormous energy conservation capacity. From the, point of view of, from the point of view of policy, policy both on the federal level, also on the local level, the Internet of Everything is actually going to turn into be one of the tools that enables economic development and really improves the quality of life on the local level in terms of delivering services. Because right now, if you're a city or a municipality, the Internet helps, but it doesn't really get it what you need without a lot of extra information. Let me just give one more example. The city of Fort Collins out in Colorado where they're having all this horrific flooding. Well, what they did a few years ago is they put in a bunch of remote rain gauges and stream gauges, and then they put them on the internet, and then they put them on smartphones. So now all of a sudden there's a connection between what's happening in the real world, the information goes right to you, and presumably we'll sort of find out whether or not this helped people sort of deal with the flooding better. I mean, there's no way to tell right now, but boy, this is, this is exactly what it was designed to deal with. Amit, um, how much does a Bitponic system cost? So it's going to retail for 500, uh, which is actually very competitive with uh, other manual um, hydroponic sensing. So is that no matter the size of your garden? Excuse me? Is that no matter how big your garden is? Right, with hydroponics, like a right. one time investment? Yeah, uh, okay. that's, the, that's the cool thing about hydroponics is actually you can have any size reservoir powering any size garden. So you can have like a very large scale garden powered by a single thousand gallon reservoir. Mm -hmm. And um, measuring that single point allows you to know how the entire garden is doing. And part of the vision is for people like in New York City and cities like Detroit, they can have a garden in their home, right? In your apartment, right, yeah. I mean, that's actually how I got into it is I, I live in a small Brooklyn apartment. <laughs> and have no outdoor space for a garden. Um, and I wanted to, to be able to have a, a garden. I wanted to be able to grow some of my own food in, in, in my apartment. And um, you know, hydroponics was 
a step to, to getting there because you can use your space a lot more efficiently. You can use a lot less water, a lot less nutrients. Um, you can play with form factor better, so you can use like a vertical garden, which is not so easy to do with soil. Um, and it's also much more automatable. You know, because you're creating the entire growing environment, you can, um, you can plug your lights and your pumps into this, this automation device and really have the intelligence of the internet brought to bear on, on helping you grow your garden. Greg, I want to talk a little bit about maps in cars. Have you heard sure. of Waze? Yeah, Waze. sure. Have you used yeah. Waze? Mm -hmm. um, Google obviously just bought Waze sure. for a billion dollars. I use Waze every day, and I do have a navigation sure. system in my car, but now Waze is, is better. You know, right. My car's a few years old. It's a great example of why your car needs to be connected. I mean, one of the most frustrating things about those built-in nav systems is the data is out of date within months of buying the car. So or when or is my weeks. car going to so, have Waze in it? Or, you know, just tra well, updated traffic you, you need your car to be connected uh, to be able to report its location <laughs> as a participant in the Waze network if, if you want to go to Waze. And, and you also need an ability to get the latest point of interest information loaded into your car so that you have the latest information. So you're going to see some significant changes, particularly in navigation. Um, what kinds of things can you tell us? Anything about what GM is working on? In well, this uh, one thing that's uh, I'm just getting at uh, pretty pretty clearly: you're not going to have the same need to carry all the data around with you, and you're not going to have the need to update it in the same way you've had to update it by plugging in a DVD and doing all the things. The, the data will always be fresh because you're always connected to the latest data, and not only that, you're contributing data to the Good. system in a, in a way that makes it lower cost to bring it to everybody, which is a little bit of what Waze demonstrates on a, on a, a certain scale, but. Scaling that to everything and, and then getting to the, the city management thing, there's going to be a lot of incentives to plug into municipal systems that can tell you about availability of parking, avail uh, traffic patterns, and, and road also closures, if something goes wrong, what is the best alternative route? Mm -hmm. Now that's something that has to come not just from the waste system, but actually has to that's something that the local municipality has to get involved with to be able to sort of say, okay. It's better if everybody goes this way. Okay. Right, but obviously municipalities, cities, governments, they move so, so slowly. But you see, but that's the thing. There's going to be a competitive advantage for local governments that can move faster and embrace this. This is about, if you get to the heart of the Cisco vision, which is the data, the processes, the people, and the things, the more you can integrate, make real-time decisions, the better off you're going to be. And in some sense, we're learning how to gather the data, process the data, and then figure out how to use the data. It's an order of magnitude higher than what we're doing now because there's so much more data involved in dealing with the physical world. Now, the other, gonna, uh, go ahead. The other thing with, with the Internet of Things is that, um, for example, cities don't need to do the full stack of creating a service. You know, like New York City has actually done this, this awesome thing called New York City Big Apps where basically they expose all of the city data through APIs, and they let software engineers just have at it. So uh, they build one piece of it where they expose the data, and then they let the New York City engineers like create the services on top of that. And that's what's exciting about the whole developer community. That you, you'll create things that you never thought you were going to create by putting together, mashing up different data sources. We had, we had a group of kids they were all learning how to drive. 15, 16 year old kids came to one of our events, gave them our software development kit. They put it together with two or three other data sources to create a learning how to drive app that was relevant to them. It allowed them to log their time, which is an important problem for them, to log the time driven and time driven at day and night. It allowed them to consult um, uh, local speed limits because they were concerned about not breaking the speed limit and even <laughs> get to instructional they? videos. They were looking for <laughs> videos for, I can't remember what they told me about how to parallel park. And they would pull down a parallel parking video. If, if my car could parallel screen. park for me, I'd be really So, happy. not the kind of thing that we would have come up with all do, on our own. But I haven't actually yeah. tried it out. Uh, one question for Greg, and then I'm going to take it yeah. to you, Vishaka. But on Waze, why wouldn't a GM or a car company buy Waze? I know it's expensive. Why wouldn't is, we buy Waze? Why wouldn't you buy it? I mean, is it is it do you is there a, a philosophy about innovating from within versus without? I mean, our, our view is our first priority, we're, we're in the car business. We're trying to make better cars. So our better or higher priority is how do we make the best use of a service like Waze versus anybody else? So how can we add data to it? How can we make it more usable in the car? Those are the priorities for us because our view is if our cars are more enjoyable to own, easier to drive, lower cost to own, um, that's how we win. Um, and the services are a means to that end. And we, OnStar is an example, we are in the service business also to a degree. 
but uh, it starts with how do we make a better car and how do we make a better car sooner than everybody else does. That's, that's how we win. Now, Cisco, on the other hand, does make a lot of acquisitions. And you know, what is the, the strategy there in terms of when you realize, look, we can do better if we just buy this? Yeah, absolutely. We continue to take a look at what's going on out there. I mean, we clearly see the internet of everything as the next huge market transition. Only 99.4% of all the possible things out there in the world are connected today. So 99, so that's a whole, I mean, it's a whole ton of things that are not connected, that are gonna get connected, and the network's gonna be key. So clearly, clearly we are looking at a whole host of acquisitions in that space. Do we have any questions yet? Go ahead. You want me to use a microphone or do it here? Sure, is there a, a microphone somewhere? I the microphone, there's oh, a yeah. microphone over there. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for being here. Andrew Humphrey, WDIV, right here in Detroit. On the developer uh, aspect of things, what, I, this is a question for all the panelists, mm -hmm. uh, especially the business panelists. Uh, when you come up with the idea or you start utilizing developers that are out there, what conversations are you having with your legal department regarding liability and regarding ownership of, say, patents or trademarks or copyrights? <laughs> um, I, can, I can answer our part of it. I'm sure you guys have a perspective on it, too. Um, yeah, this is a new space for us, Andrew, so we have to think hard about how to design systems so that they're secure, so our developer or our um, application environment is, is secure from the rest of the operations of the vehicle. Um, we have to make sure we're handling people's intellectual property, property carefully, so uh, we make sure that we disclose to people what they're doing when they submit their information and, and uh, you know, what they're signing up for, so that's, that's important. We've learned that from other industries, the, the cell phone industries and so forth. Um, uh, and then safety and security, we've, we've been working really hard. This is a space that, you know, the first priority is driving the car safely, obviously. It's not doing distracting things. So we're working carefully with the rest of the industry to establish standards for safe use of applications and content in the vehicle. And in fact, we think we're going to be making our services safer than the alternatives that people are using today. So if people are consulting Google Maps this way, <laughs> or if they're playing with their phone um, uh, to get music services down, we think we can do things to make similar uses safe. And, and our software development kit actually gives developers guidance as to how to do it in a way that we think can be done in a, in a non-distracting way. So it's something we've thought a lot about. Got it. Um, regarding the liability issues, I, I think uh, Were there I previous from... <laughs> patents for online gardening? <laughs> Uh, Depends on what you're issued. gardening, I suppose. <laughs> no, there weren't any patents for, for cloud-connected internet guards. We have a, a patent pending, okay. yeah. <laughs> it's just part of having uh, your, your defenses up for being a startup nowadays. If you think about the, uh, the relationship between app developers and then, say, Apple or Google or the telecom companies, before the App Store, it was actually harder to figure out how to answer a question like that. But now there's a model where there's a clear separation in layers between apps that run on top of other layers. So if you think about apps running on top of cars as opposed to smartphones, then you've got a, 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 an interesting division. The security question is very obviously very important these days. Though. Right, so let's address that question. You know, how do we connect everything to the internet and make sure that our data, our information is safe? in the world of, in the age of the NSA and <laughs> many reports of government spying and, and not just spying, but working with tech companies reportedly to get our information. You want Who wants to take a stab at that one? <laughs> well, certainly we're, as you all know, we're the networking company and certainly you all know that we're addressing security and our solutions and software in a very big way. What's interesting to me is as we, and we, we obviously innovate internally as well as do acquisitions, but when we innovate with things like our Jabber with not just being able to instant message with another person, but with another device, we are absolutely paying attention to the security of that connection um, because that is not something you want anyone else to mess with. I actually found it quite shocking that Cisco wasn't on the list of nine companies that are supposed to be associated with Prism. Given that Cisco owns networking and, and video conference. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> you know, one of the interesting questions is, and I, and I think that Greg referred to this, you don't want anybody to be able to take over your car. 
Sure. If you have an, if you, and, and I'm sure that GM and the other uh, car companies are paying very close attention to that. And I think this becomes a distinguishing feature between different companies. What you'll see is that the ones that pay attention to security and provide a good connected product are the ones that are going to do well. Okay? And there's going to be a lot of issues around this over in the coming years, and we'll figure it out the same way we figured out other stuff. So it's going to turn out to be, it's going to turn out to be an issue. It's going to turn out to be a bar that distinguishes some companies from others. And you'll end up using companies that you feel secure with. And that's really kind of the bottom line. There's, there's an incentive. There's not an incentive to put out insecure products, and especially if you're an internet of everything world. If you have a question, by the way, just come up to the mic and we'll get to it. Um, Greg, do you worry about cars being hacked? Sure. I mean, uh, there's, there's people out there already that you can find um, YouTube videos and others, people showing, showing things that they're trying to do to hack uh, vehicles. And yeah, it's, we're as, we have to be as concerned about that as, as anybody in some ways more so because the car is a you know, 2,000 pound machine and, and could be dangerous if somebody's messing with it. So we're very concerned with it. Um, it's, it's one of the things that we think a lot about when we, when we say we're opening up our development environment to developers, our certification processes require that we do a lot of security checks to make sure that, that, that we're controlling for that. But it's, it's certainly something we have to watch for. Um, no different than anybody else, and, and probably more so. Question. Uh, Eric Kushner from CompuWare. Uh, I think of connecting all these devices to the network, and I wonder who foots the bill for it? If it, is it the service provider? Does you know, the consumer carry the connectivity into the device in the case of the car? You know, I think of throttling of traffic, you know, Netflix, obviously there's some precedent there. How does this all work? What's the economics behind it? I think that goes back to the value. It goes back to who's going to get the value out of it. Who's defining that critical you know, business and IT initiative that recognizes very clearly this is a use case, this is a critical problem that you're solving. Here is how the Internet of Everything solution, maybe combined with collaboration, really helps you address that problem. And then how, what's the metric that's impacted that actually helps you quantify and justify your investment? But it all goes back, in my mind, to the value. Let me add one more thing to that. The cost of some of the pieces of this is going way down. If you look at your smartphone, your smartphone contains all these sensors in it, including ones that you probably never use. It, at least mine contains, it, it does magnetic fields, it does light, it does sound. It, it, goes like, it has a list of about 15 sensors in it. The cost of doing these sensors is getting less and less. And the data processing capability of dealing with all this information, e even a couple of years ago, would not have been easy to do. It's getting easier and easier all the time. So I think what you're thinking about here is that the cost is falling at the same time that what we can do with it is, is rising. I'm sure if we track the cost of the electronics in the car versus, versus the capability, you'd see that the cost per capability has been falling. And, um, and that's what we see. I mean, whether or not you could have built your device five years ago. Right. Okay, is, you know, we're, the, the technological frontier is rushing forward very fast. I think one thing he's, he's getting at, though, is the fact that uh, this is a continual service that you're providing. It's not just a one-time build. So how do, you, how do you pay for a continuing service of storing that data, providing you know, real-time alerts and whatnot uh, to your users based upon that data? And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. There are you know, sort of two ways you can go. One is to ask the consumer to pay for that as, as a service. Um, or you can monetize that data, you, you know, sell it to third parties as big data or run advertising based upon that. You know, it is a giant new data stream that you have where you're learning how users are interacting with their world. So it's, it is a brand new venue for, for data that can be monetizable. Yeah, and I don't think there's any single answer for, for our industry any more than there is for a lot of other industries that are working through the right business model for this. Um, we think there's several, actually, and we've touched on them. If there's, and it depends on who you're trying to serve. If it's a service like the customer wants to stream a movie to their back seat, well, that's probably not something that's going to come with the car, by and large. That's a lot of money to do that. But we know customers want to do that, um, and there'll be a way to do that. On the other hand, we may want to be able to make sure that data is available to the car if we want to be able to do diagnostic checks for some sort of urgent service issue. 
Um, so we'll pay for the data because it's important to us to keep the vehicles running the way we want them to run and to make sure the vehicles uh, meet our customers' expectations. So there's no single answer, I guess. And then I think the other talk, uh, there are third parties that are interested in paying for the data. And then we have to get into, well, let's make sure we're balancing correctly. Privacy. Should we be doing that versus, you know, is the customer willing to share that data? And that's something we didn't touch on before. But one of the things that we have to do really well is make sure the customer knows what data is being shared and, and that it's their data and that they're making a choice to share it or not to share it. So, Thank you. All right. Question over here. My name is Evan Foster. I'm a full-time student at Wayne State University in business information systems management. Um, I know one of the main questions that comes up is security. Um, and for me, I'm always eager to get more and more technology. And if I talk to my grandparents, they're terrified of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out how do you get past those barriers to entry and actually prove to people that your stuff is secure? We always talk about how do you make it secure, but how do you actually prove that it would be secure and everything, all your information that's on the internet is secure? Vishaka? It's a great question. <laughs> um, You'll probably never prove it to everybody, I'm sure. Mm. <laughs> you have the green padlock in your address bar on your browser. You have the HTTPS. Well, it's, the, I mean, it's kind of how much are you willing to pay for the security? A highly secure, medium secure, how valuable is your data? Okay. And then there's a reputation effect, exactly. which is that if you're dealing with reputable companies that have a repu that that have a reputation to lose, if something goes wrong, then you can feel then you can feel better about it. Um, you know, I'm not sure that your parents or grandparents really care that much about security per se. Part of it is about wrapping their mind around what the new capabilities are, and that's just a tough one. On that. No, you know, do you think that you are going to reach more people simply as younger people get older, or do you think you can actually convert, you know, less tech savvy people and, and, and generations? To, it's it's to, about execution. Know? I mean, I think if you my do mother's things, using email, you do things yeah, well. <laughs> Facebook, so I think that's a good sign. <laughs> you know, it, it's it maybe sound too simple, but you do things well, you make them easy to use, you make them invisible. You know, technology is best when it's not seen or when it's not obtrusive. And I think that's, that's what we need to get to is, well, it's obvious that I should be using this because it's a much better and more convenient way to do things, uh, to take care of you know, my day. Um, What's the most the important secret. demographic for GM? Like who, who are you targeting? Um, well, you know, GM is a broad market company, right? so we're, we're, we're selling to the whole car buying public. Um, so, you know, we're, we're anxious to... But do you want to get in on the ground floor? Do you want to, do you want to sell a car to a teenager or someone in their 20s so that they well, sure. like the brand and then want GM sure. for yeah, the rest sure, of their absolutely. car buying life? Absolutely. And we, and we touched on it earlier. We, we want to get to where some of those buyers are and, and the connected life that they're trying to get to. We, we talk a lot about trying to connect our cars toward people's digital lives, and that's part of what we're trying to do. People have a digital life, and they expect it to continue when they get in the car, and that's part of what we're building, too. What about Bit Bitponics? I mean, I'm assuming right now I mean, it's more of a niche c consumer, but I, my guess is you want to go big. But who's going to buy this? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's definitely, <laughs> you know, we, we got one customer right now. Um, <laughs> It's, it's definitely a, a roadmap of, of developing who we can sell this product to. Like initially, it's going to be hobbyist hydroponic growers that, that want to automate the way they currently grow. You know, currently, people do things very manually. They, they have manual sensors. They, they drop those down in a spreadsheet or something to track over time. So it's going to be existing growers that want to automate the current process. But the mission of what we're trying to do is to use technology and make it possible for everyone to have a thriving garden in their home, no matter what kind of space they have or what kind of skill set they have. Um, so the mission is to make it possible to have uh, the internet help you take care of your garden to where you don't necessarily need to read books on gardening and have all that knowledge personally. You can benefit from somebody in the internet creating a grow plan for you that you can use um, so that you know, a novice can have a, a thriving herb garden and lettuce garden in their apartment. Michael, how can the internet of everything help a place like Detroit? Well, I think that Detroit is one of those examples of, it's a place that's built on physical industries, which have not been benefited that much by the internet. 
Um, I'm struck, there was an earlier discussion about urban farming here, mm -hmm. and there's an immediate connection, I'm not saying this is the most obvious, there's an immediate connection between urban farming and then sort of being able to automate it. There's a connection between transportation and being able to sort of get buses to where you need them on a more efficient basis in a very large area. There's an immediate connection between how do you do um, uh, deal with crime, you know, in terms of getting a connectivity between uh, information you have on the local level and then being able to connect it up. There, you, and most important, which we haven't talked about, the link between the Internet of Everything and education. Right, right now, it's actually very expensive to sort of train people for sort of mid-skill level jobs. It has to be done manually. What the Internet of Everything does is potentially enable you to lower the cost of training and bring more people into the workforce. Cisco has this great example, which I referenced in my paper, of a network basketball. It is a basketball that has lots of sensors in it that could potentially be programmed so that it would teach you how to shoot a basketball, give you immediate real-time feedback. Translate that into the world of training somebody how to use a machine or training somebody how to use up-to-date equipment, very expensive to do in the schools. And all of a sudden, you've got a different model of education that doesn't just apply to high-end uh, 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 you know, distance learning, but applies to the training of people to do the sort of jobs that we need people for right now. And so this is one step beyond where we are right now. But if you think about any time you have an interaction with the physical world, the Internet of Everything could help you in ways that you don't actually understand right now. So if I look at a place like Detroit, it has to deliver better services at a lower cost Internet of everything. Are we ever going to have everything connected? Like, will we ever get there where? Absolutely. The, the Internet of everything is <laughs> real. It's because you know? there's going to be so much value for doing that. And if you don't, and if you don't participate in that, I think it's going to be challenging. It's, it's a matter of time. I mean, exactly. it's, it's a matter of the components getting cheaper and smaller and more able to be embedded within everything. Um, you know, once that cost goes down, there's no reason not to have some intelligence in everything that's around you. And, um, you know, one other point that I wanted to bring up is that what the Internet of Everything makes possible is to have humans do what they do best and to have technology do what it does best in, in everything around you. So that means technology does the stuff that's repetitive, rote, menial, robotic. And humans can then move into the more creative, uh, larger scale endeavors. Question. Mine is not actually a question, it is actually more of a response. My name is Judy Balda Sancho. I own a startup company, it's called Health and Ideas. Um, really, the reason I founded my company as a virtual company is I am a director of eight member organization. Um, my specialty is physical therapy, sports medicine, um, and I'm also the sitting clinical director of Special Olympics right now. Um, I'm kind of a lot of my students, um, we, we do doctoral programs, so a lot of my students are 21 and under. But then a lot of the ac academic um, ACCEs, they're at 60 years old. And I am at 40, so I'm kind of like a conduit to them. Um, so I think it's, it's not being um, taught out there, but really for the past five years, I would say, I've been using te technology to train my students. It started with, um, I had a student from University of Michigan, Flint. And when I was still practicing my clinical practice, I was in St. Clair Shores. I hate driving, so I said, you know what? If you can go online, Skype, email, we will work on this evidence-based project for six months using technology. And the university allowed me to do that. And so then after that, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna use technology for grading my students um, and training them. So, like even now, when I do my uh, Special Olympics, a lot of my teaching is done by YouTube. I got Special Olympics to say, you know what, we're analyzing all this data. We need, I'm not, I've done it manually for about a year, and I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. Let's use a computer. Um, and I'm not gonna like send out all these mails to all these universities in Michigan to train you guys. That's a lot of work for me being it a volunteer job aside from my other job. So uh, all of those are happening, but it's not 
being broadcasted. It's not on television. Um, we're doing it. It's just not out there. And really, I don't think I can um, help eight organizations without my smartphone. Yeah. <laughs> and, and really, I don't. I think I cannot run this company. It's a continuing education seminar company for sports medicine without technology. Um, I can have PayPal on, on my smartphone or any terminal, virtual terminal. Um, and so, and really that's the reason why I'm here because a lot of attendees are from the internet, uh, from the IT world, from auto, some from education. But I'm trying to like um, bridge the gap, I guess is what I'm doing. Thank you. Um, so thank you for uh, Very cool. using this session because really technology is not just about computer. It's utilizing the people and, and how are you going to use technology to really make your life easier. So thanks for this. this a, Thank I you. think it's the best topic so far for me. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. On that note, so obviously technology has made millions of things possible. It's given us more flexibility. It's enabled us to be more productive. But is it possible to have the internet of everything without losing something? Is, is the internet of everything always better? Is it better for my garden to be connected in every circumstance and situation? <laughs> Do yes. some plants just need <laughs> yes. to be yes. held? Yes, they're free. Let, can, I, can I give you an example? Suppose you lived in a little town that had no road connection to the rest of the world, and it's all kind of isolated. And somebody says, we're going to build a road so that the cars can sort of run to your road. Some people will oppose that because it's going to change the culture of the town. And it will change the culture of the town. But the fact of the matter is, one of the things the Internet of Everything is going to give us, it's going to give us faster growth. I mean, and maybe, and it's going to give us, and it's going to, it's going to give us faster growth, and it's going to give us more jobs. And in the end, right. that's kind it of what give, we want. It will give this town many more things, but right. will it lose something too? Uh, you well, know? I mean, so what the Internet of Everything is doing is eliminating the, the repetitive rote tasks, right? And my question is like, is that something that you really want to do? I would rather have that get taken away. I think that's, that's a net benefit. But the more that technology makes possible, the more that you're, we're going to push the boundaries. You know, maybe it's not just the repeat. Maybe the computers start to do some thinking for us. I mean, what Google is trying to do with search is it's trying to anticipate what we want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just giving you a list of results. It's giving you a list of results for you personally, yeah. right? Um, at, at it certainly changes, you know, discovery. At, and at every step along the way in technological change, there's always something lost and something gained. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is that right now, we and the developed world in general sort of face this enormous problem. We have slow growth. We have an aging population. We, we are heading towards fiscal disaster unless we change something about the equation. And the equa part of the equation that we have to change, we have to increase productivity in manufacturing, in transportation, in healthcare, in public services. If you, we don't do that, we will have a much meaner life, and I don't mean in a good sense, 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. This is an essential part of getting us out of the trap that we're in and moving forward into a better world. Will we lose things? Things will change. That's probably the best way of putting it. You know, it. a perfect example, sure. I just thought I was driving a stick shift. People still drive stick shift, right? Sure. Like, they want to. They like it. Right. So it's sort of you know, analogous to what I'm talking about, which is, and it's, and it's can a choice, we maintain, right? like, can we give the people who want to drive stick the ability to do that, but also still connect to everything? Well, and that's, that's a great example, though, really, of, of how you, the best answer is to give people choice. People that want to drive that way and drive for the enjoyment of being that much more connected to the road, I, I understand that, and that's, that's a choice that people have available to them. But, but picking an awful up lot of people prefer not to have to do that and stop and go traffic, and, mm -hmm. and, and the majority do, and those choices are available. And I think the same answer here is it's, it's informed, it's choice, it's you have the opportunity to do these things and um, opportunity to redirect your time to something that you would rather do, or if you would rather dig in the garden with, with your hands, and I suppose um, it's not going to yeah. get in the way of doing something like that. No. 
I but because of the link to value, because of the link to jobs, it is always better. I mean, this is this is about not just prosperity of Detroit. It's it's the U.S. I, I mean, I was amazed when I looked at the research because it actually showed that you know um, I think it was China and India that were just more I mean, as you sort of looked at the respondents and how, who replied how and it, those countries are just hell bent on the internet of everything is absolutely going to just take us at warp speed to where we need to go. Now we're still about to release the new research on um, the research that we did, it was just on private sector. We're about to release the research on public sector, but I think we can't afford not to do this and to prioritize this from a, from a political agenda, business agenda. Um, we have to go after this value. I, uh, I'll tell my little personal story. I'm Indian, born in Africa, raised in England, and I live wow. here. And I've had a lot of, a lot of my family has worked really hard to get us to this great place. So I, uh, I hope that we embrace the challenge ahead of us. I think it's going to be fun. And we just have a few more minutes. So, Oh, and I just wanted to say, Emily, that if anyone's interested in the Cisco point of view on the internet of everything, we have thumb drives for all of you that we're happy to give you. So if the rest of you could just give quick closing thoughts, something really profound. You know? <laughs> Ouch. Michael, no pressure. Uh, Michael. Something really profound. <laughs> well, the only thing I would say about that is, is that people worry about, uh, uh, about where, how, whether they should be optimistic or pessimistic about the economy going forward. And one of the reasons to be optimistic is, in fact, the internet of everything, because you can see the way that it can transform some of the areas that bother people the most. And so in this debate about where we're going, what the future is going to look like, whether or not this technological change that can really make a difference. Here's an area where you can see where something we can do that is coming on the horizon that can make a very big difference politically, fiscally, standard of living, and thinking about whether or not we're going to all be able to sort of age gracefully or not. So, you know, that's the context you have to think about. It's, you know, each of these things are pieces of a larger picture. Sure. Um, so the, the internet of everything, I think, is really the next wave of, of technological development, as the other panelists have, have talked about. Um, the new world is going to be the world that's created with uh, intelligence and logic within everything that we create. And what we've seen so far with the internet has been really the internet of, of people. You know, we've seen things like Wikipedia get created just by accumulating the knowledge that exists in people's heads. And what the Internet of Everything is going to bring online is the intelligence that's within every physical thing in the world. And so I think that bringing to bear the combination of human intelligence and machine intelligence is going to be just a super exciting thing to, to see come out of this. Uh, and I'm just uh, I'm confident that this is going to be a big part of General Motors' future and the future of the auto industry. And, and being a longtime General Motors employee, but also being a longtime Detroiter, I'm also excited about the potential for this to help regenerate um, this city and this this region. Um, you know, our our company and others through innovation built this region. Uh, we've been through some difficult times, obviously, the last last several years, but. I believe that this is the next wave of innovation. Uh, it's an investment that we're making uh, on that belief that we're going to have an ability to make our cars and our, our, our company that much more prosperous. And we think that there's a great opportunity to extend that um, to this region and help, help build the region through a new wave of innovation in, in using this technology. This is transformative, not just for the car companies, but for all the companies that grow up around the car companies. You know, when we did an analysis of the app economy nationally, we were surprised to see an enormous growth in the Detroit area in terms of app developers. And a lot of this was companies flowing out to take advantage of these opportunities. So you can actually imagine that this is an essential part of the rebirth of this area, built around not just the car companies, but all the companies that have different types of suppliers than we had before. All right. Well, Vishaka Radia, Michael Mandel, Amit Kumar, and Greg Ross, thank you all for this really fascinating conversation and showing us a window into the future. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. <laughs>